Well, and I like they got that fishing league going. Yep. They got oh, a the fishing, fishing fishing group here at the high Yeah, my where do they go? Twenty seven thirty and summer, three three when they had oh, us. So I don't know how different lakes. We were right about where Cedar Lake. That ain't add on no, one more kid no. and it would have bumped oh, them out to where we are. Yeah, I would imagine they for bass fishing. Man, we would be the best. Yeah. Well, I think that's great. But yeah. as I was saying, yeah, my my biggest fear is that the test that Especially told me I was did. done <laughs> wrong and somehow got contaminated. I didn't worry about all these troubled kids. You know, when I was a kid, they, we'd get them into hockey. We'd all go to you know. Yeah, my folks were. They'd work out some. Yeah, they got married when uh, eighteen and twenty-two. <laughs> okay. World War Two. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of a push to establish. So. Kids in a couple of years. <laughs> no, my mom had two older brothers. Um, the next one was like 10 stuff. years I'm older. And she said that her and her sister were twins. Oh, wow. They were surprised. Or like the parents did this. It's 150. I and suddenly we're having twin girls. Yeah, but I yep. I mean, in, yeah, and back in those days. Yeah, and like, it's all licensed for. Uh, like how to stop stuff like that. And so I'm sure like the twins was a surprise. Yeah, yeah. in twins and triplets run in my family. Um, I don't have children, and neither does my sister. We were going to use that number. Yeah, we were going to use that number when we were looking well, at Well, yeah, that. so, yeah, my mom was an identical twin. Her she grandmother was an identical twin. Apparently, twins yeah. skip generations. Yes, they do. But they yeah, tend to follow the female side. Right. Yes. And so my brothers and I, I guess, were no more likely than anybody else to have them, but we were all waiting for my cousin Carly yep. to have twins. Yeah. She, she never did. So. Well, okay, I'll call the meeting to order. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is to approve the regular agenda. I would take a motion to do that. I would ask just so for one uh, change, if we could have the uh, item D, Separated on consent. No, this treat is a separate item. No, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Was that too early? No, no, uh, no. So 3D. Oh, yeah, 3D. I'm sorry. I saw fireworks and I got D and E all together. So, so 3D moved to just a separate say 12D. item. 12D. Sure. <laughs> or, or we could just right behind it. Yeah, I mean, that works too. Yeah, let's do it just right behind it. Okay. So, any other things on the consent agenda to be moved? Otherwise, I'd take a motion to approve the regular agenda. So moved. Second. There's been a motion and second. Is there all in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now, the consent agenda, we, we're moving item D out separately. Um, any other things that need to be changed on that one? I, I'm just not sure if uh, a typo or if the trail seal coating, we just have one bid, so I think it refers to a low bid. I'm assuming that's just a typo then. There is no other bidder is that on that. Um, it says, quote. Yeah, so the third year now we have not received a second bid because <clears throat> The application we asked for is a bean oil, and there's only one company in Minnesota slash Wisconsin that does this product, so there is no quote second quote I can get. Uh, okay. Only other option would be something that we would not be in favor of, which would be a fog seal, uh, which we did about 15 years ago and had really bad luck with it. So it probably is a typo if I wrote, um, if I received two quotes, I did not. I only received one, so that would be a typo if I did that on my memo. Right, I think we just eliminate the word low. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, I take a motion to approve that consent agenda with those additions. So moved. Second? I'll, I'll second. second. Um, any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. So then we will approve the consent agenda, excluding item D. I would take a motion to approve that. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. There's been a motion by Rick, seconded by Maggie. Any other discussion on those items? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Now we'll go and we'll uh, bring this back, the 
Minnesota Lawful Gambling Exempt Permit for Forward New Prague Foundation. Um, I think you, you have a conflict, right? I think I just want to do it. Oh, you want to do it now? I want so to forget. Yeah, I, I appreciate you doing it now so we don't forget to do it. Yep. Um, I just uh, uh, just keep things clean. I am uh, Dent Gardner and myself created this company uh, to f kind of fill a void where uh, places want to raise funds and through either the school or the city, they don't want to deal with that. So this company is created for that purpose. I'm an officer of this company. I have no financial benefit nor or any other um, thing to do with it. But since I'm an officer, I'd rather not be involved. In okay. So I'll take a motion um, to approve item D. So moved. There's been a motion by Maggie. I'll second. second or right. Rick seconded it. Um, any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 And then why don't abstain. You, yeah, Bruce abstained. Motion carries. Okay. Recreation study update. Old architects. Hi. Hey, Aaron Council. It's good to be back again on a different topic today. Whenever you're ready. This is a presentation up. Not working much. We should have paper copies, I believe. Yeah, we do. Yep. Yep. specialist on the case. <laughs> uh, well, I do know you have you have a copy of the PowerPoint as well, so we'll go ahead and get started on it. If it pops up, that's great. Um, the One of the things that we wanted to visit on today was just kind of give you an update on where we're at as far as looking at some of the existing uh, amenities that the city has to offer, as well as starting to look at where there might be some ideas related to things that, you know, perhaps we could do better or add more services. So um, there was a survey done of all the athletic associations and you have a summary of that in your packet as well. Uh, the only thing we have not done to date is really kind of walk through the actual fields themselves that is still on our agenda to do but you can see as we go through some of the remarks and stuff like that there's some anecdotal information regarding that. Um, and then there is uh, some information that uh, has been out on kind of the, the rec stuff for number of years and so we'll kind of talk through some of the ideas that are out there and get some feedback on next steps. Um, feels like it's starting to pop up. The uh, What I did was I took the inventory of all of the, the city parks, the rec center, the community center, and also the uh, other facilities that are used that are, aren't school properties but are school related properties. So there are 10 city parks that we had identified, Memorial Park, North Side, Foundry Hill, South Side, Phillips Park, Heritage Park, Greenway. Uh, the Yackley Cabin is listed as a park, mm -hmm. although it's small. And then the Sliding Hill uh, Park and Settlers Park. The other facility that we've included in here is the community center because there is, you know, a sheet of ice there that's used and that's part of the conversation with the associations. And then there are a number of school facil facilities, St. Wenceslas, Raven Stream Elementary School, Falcon Ridge, the Central Ed CC site, the middle school and the high school. So those are the ones that we really focused on as part of this. Uh, I did take the liberty of going through and pulling current uh, GIS images of each of the sites. You know, sometimes information in areas change and stuff like that, but uh, certainly Memorial Park is your largest park. It's 143 acres. Uh, there are walking trails. There's three ball fields in there, some volleyball fields, a playground, uh, outdoor swimming pool, uh, restrooms, etc. Uh, at that location, at Northside Park, a little smaller, obviously it's about three acres. 
There is a softball field and a tennis court there, as well as a basketball court and a playground. Uh, and it does have uh, facilities, uh, restroom facilities, etc. cetera. Uh, looking at Foundry Hill, uh, this one's about 10.7 acres. It does have walking trails on this site. It does have a ball field and a nature area, as well as a playground. Uh, looking to the southern part of the city, Southside Park is an 11.7 acre park. Uh, again, with walking trails, a ball field, a nature area, basketball court, and a playground. This uh, park also has a disc golf course out there as well. Yes, sir. A quick question. Uh, as you go through some of these, what, what uh, qualifies it to be defined as ADA access? And why does Memorial Park not ADA access? Uh, probably has to do with either the restroom facilities or parking areas. Okay. Yeah. Basically, when I was looking at the images, some of the parks don't really have true bathrooms or at least accessible restrooms out there. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Again, Phillips Park uh, is about five acres, a little less. Uh, there are no fields at this site. Um, there are some portable restrooms out there, a small picnic area. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, uh, just south of the uh, Yackley Cabin, uh, which, again, is just a historic uh, site in the city. Uh, Heritage Park is uh, mostly looking at uh, um, some trails out there, a couple of basketball courts, a small picnic area, uh, but there are no athletic fields out at the Heritage Park. Uh, Greenway Park is, is mostly just trails, walking trails, uh, nature center. There are no fields out there. Uh, there is a picnic area and some off-street parking. Uh, Sliding Hill Skate Park is where you have a couple of outdoor ice rinks. Uh, there is a small warming house there, uh, skate park, um, and some walking trails. Uh, that site is also adjacent to <coughs> the high school, I believe. Uh, Settlers Park is about 10.3 acres, has some walking trails, some ball fields, small nature area, playground, and again, some portable restrooms there. So those are the 10, what I would consider, <coughs> listed parks that the city has. Uh, the other city-owned facility is a community center uh, that's next to the um, gymnastics arena. Uh, it does have a hockey rink in there, some general skating. It is ADA accessible. But the whole site with the parking is roughly about 2.7 acres, uh, and it's just north of the uh, football field stadium. St. Wenceslas does have some ball fields out there, uh, some soccer fields, playground, etc. I uh, don't know much more about that site other than what was shown on the documentation that we had, but uh, there are likely some indoor facilities there that are mentioned in some of the uh, association surveys. Adjacent to Ravenstream Elementary, there's a 13-acre parcel there that has some ball fields on it. Uh, there's a soccer field there, basketball courts, and a playground. Um, and then at Falcon Ridge Elementary School, again, that's where the big stadium is uh, at that location. That's about a 10-acre site uh, with some walking trails through it and a couple of ball fields, uh, basketball court, uh, and then the, obviously the football field there. As you look at the Central Ed Middle School site, that's where the Aquatic Center is also located. That whole complex is about 15 acres. Um, there's some tennis courts out there. I struggled with figuring out how many there are listed in some literature, but I couldn't honestly find them on the uh, site. But uh, perhaps they are part of the indoor uh, athletic facility there. Uh, at the high school, uh, that is the larger site where it does have the four ball fields. It has 10 tennis courts there and some football fields. Uh, so it's a fairly uh, robust uh, school site there. So that's the full inventory of what uh, we are looking at as far as available um, recreation facilities or uh, areas uh, for athletic uh, sports. Uh, we did take a look at just some started to we just started to kind of look at some metrics you know that are out there related to communities and you know amenities that different communities have um, the uh, NRPA uh, has an annual report that they do that tabulates 
cities across you know the nation into kind of a summary document to kind of give you an idea as far as based on population size what are some of the average that are seen out there there's a number of caveats in that report that talk about this is just a, a report with some data in it each community kind of deals with things differently if you're a, a heavy soccer community there might be more need for soccer facility if you're a heavy basketball so the community you might have more for that similarly mm -hmm. with uh, some of the other sports so this is intended just to give you kind of an idea of what similar size on average communities have so I focused in on populations of less than you know um, 20,000 because that was you know as we look long term for the city of New Prague we're roughly at about 8300 population right now projected perhaps out to 2045 to get to roughly about 11,000. So you're gonna, gonna be on that lower end as far as population. Some of the metrics look at, you know, amenities per thousand population, um, you know, number of acres of parkland per, you know, thousand residents, that type of stuff. And so the first two figures that are in there really kind of talk about, um, you know, how many, you know, um, looking at how many parks that you have, you know, so per thousand population, how many parks does a typical community have? Uh, the metric would suggest about, you know, uh, looking at roughly, um, the uh, um, median is about 1,223 um, residents per park. So you need to do the math on that, which I've done later in there. Similarly, uh, you know, number of acres per thousand residents for acreage would, you know, be about, you know, the metric would be about, you know, 13 uh, acres per thousand residents. So for 11,000 residents, you can imagine about 140 to 145 acres of parkland. One of the interesting graphs that was in this report talked about outdoor parks and rec facilities and it kind of listed out a lot of the facilities that we're talking about. I'm not going to go through each one of them uh, but it really t gives you an idea as kind of a metric per population looking at some of the different facilities in there. You can you know fairly easily come up with how do you rate based on this you know uh, national standard. It also had some indoor parks and rec metrics in there, which I thought were interesting as we're going to talk a little bit about what came out of the association surveys related to practice space, tournament space, mm -hmm. and some of that type of stuff. So as you look at similar size communities uh, that we're looking at here, certainly a rec center, you know, which arguably you do have one, uh, not only with the ice arena, but also with the shared facility with the school district, um, senior center, uh, you know, in our surveys, there was some desire a long time ago, but there really isn't a lot of force around that right now. Uh, aquatic centers, you know, teen centers, ice rinks. So a lot of the things that, that we've been talking about. So I then kind of took that information and kind of plugged it into what New Prague currently has for facilities um, using, you know, the kind of the numbers in there just to kind of give us a comparison to uh, what that national standard would tend to suggest. And so the two columns in there that I have um, highlighted in there look at what you would uh, perhaps look like if you followed that standard, you know, how many acres of parkland, how many parks per resident, et cetera. The middle column in there is what you have currently as city-owned parcels. And then the third column, which is highlighted there, includes kind of the non-city owned ones and so kind of looking at that information you know basically what you have kind of fits within much of those metrics that are out there what that doesn't do is align with some of the needs that have been vocalized out there so you can take this data and say okay we're doing pretty good as a community of 8300 people and we've got a, a sizable amount of facilities whether it be, you know, parkland, whether it be outdoor uh, fields, baseball fields, softball fields, tennis courts, all of that type of stuff. Um, but what that doesn't talk to is where the demand is for some of those sports. And so uh, you have to understand that this isn't a standard that people go by. This is really an iterative kind of discussion with the community and with your 
uh, recreation folks as to what types of things are the citizens here kind of looking for as you um, look to kind of some of those city amenities. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, just, I think you're referring to this chart that you're I am, yes. Could you just help me uh, walk through like acres of parkland as an example? Walk through those columns again for yep. me. So the first two columns are national information. So out of that um, <laughs> national metric, it tends to suggest that you should have um, one for the number of parks. You should have a park for every twelve hundred residents, right? That's so cool. if you have you know roughly eight thousand three hundred residents, that would doing the math on that would suggest that. At a minimum, you should have almost seven parks, right, of, of whatever size. Okay. The next one down is suggesting that um, you should have almost 13 acres of parkland per 1,000 residents. Okay. So that would suggest that a community of this size would roughly have about 106 acres of parkland. Okay. As you move over the columns, what you currently have as parks, you have 10 city-owned parks. In addition to that, you have obviously the other shared resources. Um, and then if you look at our population projections out to 11,000 people, just using those same national uh, metrics that would tend to suggest that you would need roughly about 143 acres of parkland, which today you sit at roughly about 206 acres of parkland. So, Is that unusual for a town our size to have um, 206 acres parkland? Or, or a high number like that? I don't know that I would say it's unique. I think we live in an area that parks and outdoor spaces are pretty popular with communities, and there's a lot of drive towards outdoor uh, yeah. connections and stuff like that. So you've had this number of parks for decades. So I would suggest that you would reduce the number. It just is a matter of, you know, would taking away park area to do other stuff have a negative impact on some of the other activities, whether it's walking trails or outdoor sports events or just gatherings in the park and stuff like and that. And this is a national information, so I think right. probably I'm, I'm kind of thinking Minnesota might be on the higher side anyway. But. Yeah. Well, and I think we've got some uniqueness because we've got the golf course, which is a large parcel. Right, so. yeah, but I did not. This is outside of the golf course, so this okay. the, you have two hundred and six not including the golf okay. course, based on the acreage that I totaled up for those ten parks that you have. So um, I think one of the other things, if we want to continue to study data, uh, there are some other, you know, uh, studies and things out there that have been done that we could look at comparisons of other communities to see how you compare to some of your neighbors and stuff like that. We just haven't dug into some of those other um, neighboring similar size communities as far as what they have. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. As we look at those association services, it's probably no surprise that many of them suggest that we need more space for sports activities. Uh, the associations that we that were surveyed for that were the Slow Pitch Association, Archery Club, the Boys Basketball Association, the Girls Basketball Association. Um, on the slide that you have in front of you, uh, tends to suggest that for softball, for at least for the adult league, things are looking okay. Um, but there was also a caveat in the survey that there's probably a new director, mm -hmm. hopefully a new director by now. So we may want to follow up with them. Uh, archery club, mostly related to practice, right? Not a significant issue related to fields and stuff like that, but they're getting bumped for school activities, mm -hmm. which isn't any probably any big surprise. Um, and there's, you know, no real space outside of those times. In other words, I don't think there's any city-owned facilities that are lined up for archery practice. Most of the practice is through uh, the school well, facility. Is that is that outside? Hours or the schools? Outside of yeah. the, yeah, it's outside of normal school hours, but in the high school gymnasium and or the yeah, gym. Easy. The no, but the one that we have out by the, oh, is that is that the city's? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Oh, that's fine. 
Uh, basketball came up quite a bit as needing more practice space and more uh, space for uh, programs and stuff like that. Uh, they were one of the groups that really got down to you know nuts and bolts of what they think they need, uh, stating very specifically that they think they need at least four to six basketball courts for you know their association, and um, that as they add more teams, more space is going to be necessary. Similar with the girls' basketball, um, you know, they're again, it's mostly around um, practice space. Although this uh, survey talked about, you know, that they do a tournament, and so having the opportunity for a tournament here really isn't possible. So uh, it was just something that they noted in there. Um, girls' fast pitch um, really kind of talked about that they really are doing pretty good with what they have. They did mention that Memorial Field isn't really big enough to host a tournament, mm -hmm. you know, and that that would be nice to be able to do that. Um, probably mostly around, again, having some indoor practice facilities in the wintertime is something that uh, would be beneficial for them. Um, this, there was a survey for the Girl Scouts, and there really wasn't much other than kind of a note that they would like less cost mm -hmm. using space. Uh, the gymnastics club uh, is doing pretty good as well, although they would like to have some spectator uh, seating for events. Uh, for volleyball, uh, you know, space is good, but time is not. So again, you know, uh, any sort of practice has to work its way around uh, school schedules and stuff like that. Certainly, be nice to host some events in town. So again. You know, it would be good to have some secondary space to uh, add additional programs if they could. Uh, not much from the Junior Golf League other than a request for some practice area. Uh, Lacrosse has some thoughts related to additional space. Uh, they've gone as far as to put out some proposals that, you know, uh, perhaps the council has seen related to uh, growth in that sport, and it is a fast-growing sport. It's you know it does share similar uh, space as soccer and others. So there is some issues related to space and time. Um, and while they make it work, their practices are really out of alignment with what they would need. And we certainly would like to have some more space. They currently have uh, quite a few members and expect to add more each year. Uh, pickleball was uh, uh, one that obviously is a very fast-growing activity uh, in all of the communities that we work in. Uh, it is a sport that can share similar sized spaces for, you know, if you have tennis courts, you can, you know, share them with pickleball. If you have basketball courts, you can share that with pickleball. Uh, what they are suggesting is some dedicated space would be nice. Uh, to have for that because they really get bumped out of certain facilities and some of the facilities that they're in aren't ideal for some of the work or some of the uh, stuff that they're looking to do. Um, and, you know, they've got 60 members right now and as that sport grows in popularity, they expect that they're going to grow and continue to grow and look for space. I mentioned briefly about the senior uh, facilities. It's really not a program that's happening right now, so it would take some further conversation as to how to get that uh, program up and running again and if it's something that is something that the city would like to do, uh, it would be something that would be an easy thing to kind of fit into some sort of a community or uh, recreation center. Uh, wrestling didn't really have a lot to, to say other than, you know, they're growing and wouldn't mind some larger facilities, but they are in pretty good spaces. Uh, soccer. Uh, really kind of struggles with availability and space. They rent from the school district as well. Uh, there were a number of comments in the survey about the quality of the fields. You know, there's, you know, the school fields really are, you know, not maintained to a competition level uh, was the kind of the comments in there. That would require, you know, probably some reworking of the field, some drainage, irrigation, probably some um, additional um, long-term Discussions with the school district related to uh, those fields. Uh, we certainly can take a look at them and make some suggestions uh, as it relates to, to city-owned fields, but also the school district fields. But again, that would be something that uh, would have to be a joint conversation between the two entities. 
Uh, we all know that the Community Baptist construction, once that's done, will help with that. Uh, but it's not likely to solve all of the needs of the program. Uh, they suggested the numbers that they would like to uh, have as part of this. Um, and, you know, thinking big, they suggested some sort of indoor dome type facility like some communities have would be a nice thing to have. Uh, St. Pat's Baseball Association has pretty much their own stuff. So they're, they really came to the survey with they're doing pretty good. Uh, they'd like to add some more space, but it's down in the St. Patrick area, but that'd be like 10 years out. And then the shooting club really uh, suggested that uh, most of their practice and competitions are done at the hunting club in Prior Lake. Uh, youth baseball would like some more indoor practice space. Again, kind of a common theme. Practice space is very challenging and schedules are hard. We've all heard the stories of, you know, our youth getting up super early for practice and staying super late for practice and so that's a pretty common theme throughout the hockey association uh, same thing they're pretty well beyond maxed out they're using facilities outside you know of the area lakeville the sewer etc um, and they are the ones that really suggest that the practice times are really out of alignment with what uh, some of the uh, skaters really should be looking at. Summer ice would be a nice to have. Uh, and then uh, certainly a second sheet of ice with some more locker space uh, and that type of stuff. Um, and again, a request for some tournament space. So we had good participation in the surveys. Got a, got a, got a lot of good information. One of the anecdotal things out of uh, some of the literature out there is all of these things you have to kind of take at face value with, you know, an understanding that it's not likely that you're going to be able to meet all of the needs and where you focus your efforts is really kind of part of the next steps and the feedback that we're looking for. Uh, as we looked kind of back at some of the availability of outdoor space, uh, the one that's been talked about a lot is that 40-acre uh, site that was purchased by the city a number of years ago. It's probably almost going on a decade now, right? Um, back in 2004. Was it 2004, yeah. Um, and so there was quite a bit of discussion back in 93. There was a task force that talked about this. We peripherally touched it through our relationship with the school district as far as what could possibly go out there. And there was even a diagram done that suggested a athletic complex that had a nice pinwheel in it, a competition uh, baseball, softball field in there, some multi-purpose fields, and um, some outdoor play space and stuff like that. So that occupied that entire 40-acre piece. And so that was, I think back then it had a 1.6 or $1.2 million price tag or something to that effect, if I remember. The stuff that I found, but uh, there was also uh, an expansion floated out there that if you wanted to go beyond that 40 acres, there is additional space that you had adjacent to it, which you could, you know, double the size of that. And so the va the value of that outdoor land that you have there is it could take on the challenges related to some of the um, thoughts related to pr outdoor practice space, whether that's additional baseball or softball fields, whether that's flexible fields for um, lacrosse or other sports, um, that site certainly would be large enough to handle the demand for those additional spaces. And so developing that site out would certainly uh, take care of most of the uh, outdoor facility needs that were identified through those association surveys. Probably not necessarily dedicated space for all of that, but it certainly would give uh, many of those uh, the ability to either host tournaments or to certainly get some of those practices taken care of. So then the big question is, well, what do we do about all of the indoor practice needs? And what most people land upon is, well, we need a larger community center, recreation center, you, you know, whatever title you want to put on it. So we spent a little bit of time brainstorming um, what a facility that would look like that would provide multiple basketball courts, an opportunity for uh, having indoor tennis or pickleball, you know, or a running track or walking track, fitness facility, that type of stuff. It kind of went through kind of the, the list of what amenities you might want 
and a rec center. And so certainly the list that you have there is not all encompassing and it would be good to um, do a little bit more community outreach as to what some of those indoor spaces might be. But thinking about some of the requests for indoor practice space, you're almost getting to the point of field house size facility for that. Mm -hmm. I don't like to use the word field house because that's limiting in that it's more of a re it's more of a sports related acronym versus a true recreation facility. You could provide you know a large indoor athletic space that isn't necessarily designed around a field house, but yet provides some of those same amenities. So with a facility like that, you do need some entry queuing space. And so we put together a, a square footage space for lobby, some rec offices, um, a concessions area, because if you are going to host any sort of tournament events in there, it's a good way for the associations to uh, you know, get donations and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and then some restroom facilities. So we allocated about 3,100 square feet for that lobby and entry area. The big area of the building is really that multi-purpose activity space uh, based on the thought that, you know, just looking through the information that we had received, somewhere around four basketball stations is probably where you might land for that. Now, you could go less, but, you know, you start to, there starts to be some geometry <laughs> things with that, that four just seems to fit pretty well, either in a field house configuration or in just a large open recreation space. The nice thing about designing around the basketball courts is all of those other sports also fit in there. Pickleball fits in there, tennis fits in there, uh, archery would fit in there. Uh, some of those you know, indoor practice things would also work in a facility that size, but that's a 30,000 square foot area in order to accommodate all that stuff. You would be able to put a walking track in there if you've gone to a lot of modern uh, newer rec facilities, YMCA's, or even some of the stuff uh, for the school district that usually has a walking track up above the um, basketball courts or whatever sports things. It's just a nice way to, you know, use that space. Um, and there's just some general storage for the various pieces of equipment and stuff like that that would be part of that. So that whole activity area would be roughly about 42,000 square feet. Uh, we did plan for some fitness and wellness space, um, so this could be a multi-purpose fitness area. It could handle a variety of things, whether that's aerobics, yoga, mm -hmm. dance, um, machines, whatever it might be. We al allocated roughly about 2,500 square feet for that. Some community, some rec-based locker rooms and some community-based all-gender locker rooms, which is typically the norm these days where you'd have men's and women's locker rooms and then you'd have probably a family locker room for, is another way to look at that. We did have some discussion about uh, drop-in childcare, so that mm -hmm. could be something that is a good conversation to have. Do we want to provide space for people to drop off their little ones while they're doing stuff? It's a commitment to staffing. It's a commitment to supervision and stuff like that. But it is usually something that people ask about in facilities like this, so at least for Discussion purposes, we have added some space for that as well as some general storage. <coughs> so that fitness and wellness area uh, gets to about 8,700 square feet. And then we also talked about should we provide um, flexible community-based space for meetings? You know, maybe the senior program could utilize some of that space if that was something that wanted to come back again. Uh, could be used for uh, meetings, company meetings, uh, could be used for school events, that type of stuff. So we programmed out four 600 square foot flexible spaces. For that, a small kitchenette so that, you know, you could bring in catered food and stuff like that. Uh, and then some table and chair storage. So roughly about 4,700 square feet for that. So that all told would result in a total facility size of around 70,000 square feet. So that's a pretty good size facility, but it's in line with a number of other similar facilities that other communities that we've worked with are talking about. I, we've been planning rec centers between 50 to 90,000 square feet, depending upon the amount of athletic space that you're looking at potentially doing. So. 
Um, certainly, we've had lots of conversations about cost per square foot for construction, so this isn't a small ask. Um, and, and I wasn't going to bring budget numbers today, but certainly it is something as we look to future conversations that uh, you need to be aware that um, it's a pretty good size project in order mm -hmm. to do a community center of that size. So, so what we're looking for today is just any feedback, anecdotal or otherwise, it's other things that we should be looking at. Uh, we are going to kind of take a walk through those uh, existing facilities. I'll be better able to answer your questions, Councilmember Wolf, on PDA access. You know, I'm assuming it has to do with those things, but it could also be something that I'm not thinking about. Um, maybe develop some consensus on some of those ideas that we floated out there, and then the ever fun budget conversation. So. Does Wald have a, um, um, SEH has got a lobbying division. Mm -hmm. Do you have that? We do not. Usually it is a group like them or others. There's a number of them out there that have worked hard for um, municipalities to get help with these facilities at a state level. So that is something that has had some amount of success out there. If you just go through the bonding bill, either the one that got passed or the one that was proposed, there was a, a number of asks out there for community type space, whether it's wellness, rec centers, Litchfield a number of years back got five or six million dollars. Another community I saw got 10 or 11 million dollars for them. So it just is a matter of demonstrating the need and getting the right people talking about the right stuff. Mm -hmm. So one of the things to keep in mind with any sort of state bonding and comes state requirements with it so we would want to make sure we're making whatever adjustments to the dollar ask to make sure it covers those things that you'll need to comply with whether that's you know the state's requirements for um, sustainability um, and some of those types of things that while are great things to do and we certainly advocate for doing those things uh, those are usually uh, budget-based decisions that the state is is mandating that be done because the state um, has been working towards getting um, to net zero on buildings for the past two decades. Mm -hmm. So, and that's going to up the cost and and somewhat the technology isn't even there. Yeah, um, the some of it, what they're asking, I, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. So. Where the state is at right now is you have to be able to meet 80% better than base code for energy performance for any building that uses state money. Uh, it used to be challenging to get to the 70% better than code, which was what the last step was. Now that 70%, you can, it's the technology thing that you're talking about, which is that eventually the construction industry and manufacturing catches up with that and it becomes more the norm than the exception. The, the new 10% step to get up to 80% is more challenging. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple of projects that have state money in them that um, we are working hard. Uh, it means a lot of discussions related to alternative energies, uh, lots of conversations related to uh, building construction and things like that that are fun to have but are complex. Mm -hmm. So, Any other questions? What was the square footage uh, cost again? Uh, that we uh, like five thirty-two or something, or yeah, we were in that four and a quarter and twenty-three, twenty-four <laughs> for the for public safety. So keep in mind, a large chunk of this building is large, you know, open open space. So right. uh, I would anecdotally say we would likely be a little lower than that for okay. a rec center, at least for the athletic side of it. So. I would want to talk to a couple of my construction partners as to what they're seeing for rec center costs in today's dollars, and we can look to inflate that. Uh, if we're going to be looking for other funding sources, we can inflate that out to whatever that might look like, like we've done before. But probably wouldn't be in that four and a quarter, but if you wait a couple of years, it might be. Mm -hmm. So that's all that inflation thing we've talked about before. So. Other thoughts, questions? Well, just general comments about this study, and um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure at the end of the day what we want to get out of it, what we're trying to achieve necessarily. But 
I was hoping, um, <coughs> I appreciate the data that you supplied, so I, I think that's one of the things I was looking for, some of the national or some other data metrics to look at. Um, uh, I was hoping through this process we'll get a kind of a summary of what might the trends have been, what kind of usage are we seeing at these particular parks, are we seeing as many softball games as we did five years ago, are we seeing that demand diminishing, going up, going down, you mentioned soccer, uh, town. What is our trend in New Prey? What, what is our demand for what kind of recreation? Is it soccer? Is it lacrosse? Is it softball? Is it, do, do we see our future needing a lacrosse field and no softball fields or less softball fields? That kind of a analysis, I'm not really uh, sure I can explain what I'm looking for, but I'm kind of trying to figure out what is our need? What's our trend? What, what do we see our future need? being um, and how is it being used currently um, or eat, is Memorial Park being used five times on Saturday or 20 times and so some kind of analysis I don't know if we keep track of that information at all uh, we do have our use data um, that we keep track of on our fields I know the school district I'm assuming they do but I don't know in what form they keep it in so it, it, it may be a slog to work itself through it may be easy we'd have to look at that I mean, uh, I've heard comments people have said that our softball fields in Memorial Park aren't used as much they're so how oh, where's the data to reflect that is yeah. that just something I should believe or is it is it not true or you know that kind of thing so do we do we base that our future decision on future softball fields based on that information or what information are we going to base that on and if we're going to try to support lacrosse, or we have a lot of New Prague residents that support lacrosse, how are we going to deal with that in the future? Or is that just the lacrosse people that are saying it? Or you know, I'm just trying to get at what what's a good way to get a needs analysis? I liked your comment about peer group review. If we have a similar town, the risk of that is that we're a soccer town and they're a softball town, uh, that type of thing. Or we like trees and they like softball fields. <laughs> You know, because we have a lot of green space, yeah. you know, that's counted as park as well. Yeah. And so there's value there. So I'm just kind of figuring out where, how do you look at this and where do you go to actually come up with a needs analysis mm -hmm. at the end of the day? It, <coughs> it may or may not be available. Uh, council member will certainly look to some comparisons and stuff like that and see what other information is out there that we can. <coughs> understanding a need for data is, is important. Some of it is also going to have to be your own um, understanding of your community and what you hear out there and what people are asking for, which is why we did the association surveys. And so, yeah, there is a little bit of these guys are asking for this. Do they really need it or is it a want, mm -hmm. right? And so that some of that has to kind of come through um, kind of the, your community itself, whether it's people reaching out directly to you as leaders or anecdotally through the data that they have, you know, the surveys have more information in it than what I put in this. So maybe mm -hmm. if you want to, some of the associations did a pretty good job of talking about their numbers. Yep. Others just didn't really. And so the ones that obviously have more information, like lacrosse, soccer, baseball, basketball, they may have more numbers than what they shared with us that we can reach out and try to find more. We can work with staff on what your current stuff is, but uh, the administrator's right. The school district data is fairly wide and, you know, it's not broken down in a way that would probably give you the information that you're looking for just because it gets all jumbled up with all the other stuff that's going on. So the survey that you um, <clears throat> had sent out to these associations and groups, did it get as granular as how many games you play a week or how many practice sessions you need, you know, you play per week, you know, so that it provides some uh, additional information to understand the true needs of the, of the facilities and fields that they need, as opposed to just saying our needs are not being met, mm -hmm. but we just don't have an idea of what that really means. We would have to reach out to see what level of, of detail that they keep. And I would say some of them probably have more than others. 
I would think that if they're they have practice sessions and they have yep. games that they would have that yep. documented in some way, um, especially when you need refs and umps and you know all of additional personnel for scheduling purposes that that must or hopefully would exist in some form. Um, I think that would be helpful. I think Bruce to kind of get to your needs analysis and a lot too. Of the things that we're discussing are things that we're not providing now. So right. we have the typical softball field, disc golf, and <coughs> uh, those kind of amenities. We, we're not supplying lacrosse fields or soccer fields, that type of thing now. But so I kind of wonder, you know, we have to take care of ourselves. How do we look at that? Yeah. Because the needs definitely changed when those softball fields were redone in Memorial Park. You know, softball was the thing, adult softball. They went seven or five days a week. Now, they're like you said, they're barely used. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I think I'm just muddying in the water, but because I'm not sure exactly where, what direction mm -hmm. we want to go. But uh, yeah, at the back. end of the day, this 40 acre thing still kind of puzzles me. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Have we determined that it's not a developable site even? Mm -mm. Or the reason no activity has taken place on it is, I thought it was a sewage issue or something. The real reason uh, to date has been failed referendum back in 04. And then we haven't had any organized effort to look at that again. That's really why we're looking at this study. Okay. What's the need? And that land is still available. It could be developed. With obviously, we don't have water and sewer out there, but it could be well, it could be septic at this point. But that was never a, a hard no from the county or anybody like that. So we don't have any limiting conditions on doing it, really. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. No. All right. Well, thank you, because I, I was unclear on, I thought there was this, uh, an issue with providing uh, infrastructure or something out there. But you know? I think it was more for the school at the time, if because they were talking about the trade with the school that time. Okay. But... What <clears throat> what does the amount in that uh, kitty fund from the Dozinki softball? It was up over a hundred thousand dollars at one point. Yeah, hundred and twenty ish, I think. But that was designated specifically for a concession building for a future um, softball complex. That's what their wishes for the donation were at that right. point. Which, again, as we've talked, we do not currently have any women's or adult softball at all occurring um, at Memorial Park. So is that need even there right. uh, for a new facility, let alone for that um, concession building with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When funds are donated like that and they're consigned to something, um, can you reassign it? I don't know the legality of that, um, but that's how they've been taken and accepted by the council was for that purpose. So I have to talk to our attorney or auditor or whoever. Any other questions? Um, no, but I um, want to second Bruce's. We, we would need some usage um, numbers just to be able to come up mm -hmm. with a, a new understanding. You know, when, once you come back to us a second time with this, it would be nice if you'd come up back with us with some numbers. Okay. Usage numbers. Yeah, I mean, I mean we, we can look at it um, and kind of see what, what numbers we can compile and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, one note, I know obviously the more that we dig into data and the work that we put in, the cost of the study does go up too. And so I know at some point too, um, we'll probably have that conversation depending on how deep we want to get into it. So where we are today is we've got some good anecdotal mm -hmm. information on what people feel about certain things. What we don't have is the data to support how people feel about some of that stuff. And that's... Not uncommon, so we'll dig a little bit deeper into some of the stuff. I think there are some other uh, discussions to be had related to um, all of the facilities and what your role is versus what others should provide or be providing. And mm -hmm. uh, it's probably another conversation to have as we kind of conclude as to what we should or shouldn't be uh, yeah. looking at designing. Well, I'm personally intrigued with the idea of uh, trying to see what kind of community support there is to developing the 40 acres okay. into uh, some of the, to address some of the needs that's kind of discussed in this mm -hmm. report that are probably a little more low cost 
Yep. Uh, I think of it as being a little cost when you have a square field with lines on it, but um, but that that kind of intrigues me um, as a more of a doable thing to look at into the future and, and might address a lot of the needs. And plus, it has an uh, economic benefit to the area. Uh, certainly, your cost point to develop 40 acres for is going to be a lot less than for a building. Building. Yeah. <coughs> a lot of these groups are pretty. Uh, they have a good foundation of support already where they probably could support or donate to the construction and support of it. Too. Yeah, there was one association in particular that uh, indicated they would be willing to uh, help fund. So, you know it's out there. Yeah. yeah. And I would certainly want to um, do an open house or a listening session or something like that as we kind of get to a point where people feel like we're heading in a direction that is meaningful, and then we can you know, open it up for a broader perspective beyond just the associations that we had talked to. So, mm -hmm. okay. so we'll keep uh, plowing away at this over the next few months. I would like to keep some momentum on it, so I will get back with uh, Josh and others to kind of talk through next steps on that, and we'll come back and visit again. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. It's, yep. yeah. it's good to see you again. All right. Um, the next item up on the agenda is city engineer project updates. Are you, is he? He's online. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hope you can hear me. Okay. Can hear you. Can't see you, but maybe that's the reason. I've got my camera on. Hopefully it comes okay. in. But uh, I. First time I have for for our project update, like we have a normal normal meetings. Um, not sure if there are any questions on that. I'll just kind of highlight a couple things real quick. Um, the uh, 2023 project is moving ahead very well. Um, lots of areas with curve and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing some blacktop around the first week of July or the 4th of July week. Um, so, uh, I don't know if there are any questions on that. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to kind of take a look at that area in the east. It's, it's coming together pretty well. Uh, moving ahead on there, um, I do have uh, an item for the 2024 Street and Utility Improvements Project that is next on the agenda. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to kind of keep moving through here unless there's any questions on my, my project update. No, I didn't have it. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so what I do... What I do have for you the next time on the agenda is the uh, feasibility report proposal for the 2024 Street and Utility Improvements Project. Uh, this is uh, the project that was identified in our feasibility report last year when we were looking at the 23 through the 25 projects. Uh, so we had identified multiple streets for improvement uh, at that time. Um, we've also made a few more changes uh, after discussion with staff um, adding some sidewalk and then adding an additional uh, street, uh, an additional block of Third Street uh, Northeast. And then uh, a more significant addition is the uh, inclusion of 10th Avenue Southeast, uh, south of Main Street, uh, potentially as one or two phases of a, a mill and overlay type of improvement. Uh, so what I do have for you today is a proposal to uh, complete the feasibility report, do, uh, and that would include all of our topographic survey of these areas, uh, and then uh, the report itself uh, for preparation and uh, uh, preparation to count, I'm sorry, for presenting to council uh, in September and October for approval and hopefully moving to a design project afterward. Uh, so, uh, very similar to the type of report we put together on previous projects has our draft assessment roles and, and all that information. A couple couple unique items with this one. Uh, we do have uh, the mill and overlay portion, like I mentioned, on 10th Avenue Southeast with a lot of um, properties that are abutting the project that don't necessarily fit directly into the city's assessment policy. Mm -hmm. So we would have some, some work to kind of uh, look at that, make sure we're properly and fairly assessing uh, benefiting properties. Um, it includes uh, the review of completing a, a mini roundabout at Third Street Southeast uh, at 10th Avenue, and then uh, potentially some other uh, median improvements or other kind of traffic calming type things that may, may be a benefit to that street. Uh, 
this would be a state aid project when it moves to moves to that phase. Um, otherwise, uh, similar schedule overall to what we presented um, for the for the 2023 project with uh, holding a public hearing in October and then going to design for a, a late January bidding. Um, again, that'd be for a future phase, but uh, with that, I guess I'll ask if there are any questions. Um, on the map, the color, could you just describe the color coding here? The yellow is? Uh, yes. Yeah, so this is a map that I uh, had included with uh, a staff discussion, and I just wanted to, to provide that for council to look at. So if you look at that map, um, there's the 2024 project area. It's an orangish color, I think, on my screen, uh, and that would be the 2024 project. There's a magenta color to the west, which is for 2025. Um, and then this is uh, directly west of the project that was just completed or under construction this year. Um, so this uh, would have everything in orange being uh, the reconstruction area, I guess, is probably the better way to put it. Okay. Um, and then I do have one more figure afterwards, which is showing 10th Avenue Southeast. This one doesn't have the, the pretty color coding and everything, but... <laughs> This is just uh, showing the, uh, just to explain that one a little bit, each of those kind of rectangles on there are separate phases of the 10th Avenue Southeast original construction. Mm -hmm. And so again, I'll use for uh, an internal discussion, just to kind of figure out um, when things were built and just get an idea of when that, how that might correlate to future phasing. Just get back to the colors again, the yellow lines and the black lines is for sidewalks. Is that different oh, years? Yeah. Yeah, what? The, the black line on those ones, it's, it's more printing black just because of the, the scale of the drawing. Um, it's uh, Those are showing sidewalks potentially. So we do have a couple streets that are not proposed for reconstruction, um, but uh, are likely to include sidewalk, uh, at least a review of sidewalk in those areas. I think that will happen on uh, Lexington Avenue. Um, one, block, uh, one block of Third Street, a block of Second Street um, at least. And... Um, those are outside the reconstruction areas, at least. And then wherever we are doing full reconstruction would likely include sidewalk on at least one side as well. They may not necessarily be showing on there, but uh, the, the review of during the feasibility report, we decide which side of the street that sidewalk would end up on. So if I understood what you just said, the black lines are black because they're not part of the street construction? Correct. Yeah, they show that dark black mostly because of the scale. There's a really if if I was zoom in really close, I'd probably see a little bit of orange in between them. But it's just the um, but the black line is is trying to dig, show where sidewalk would go. And then um, the black lines are the the coming east. I think it's east. I, I can't turn my page because we don't we don't have that capability. But it's east of Lexington. I'm just puzzled by. Uh, the sidewalks going east and then north on second going east and then north on sunset. So that's past the park up until that's up to the new sidewalks that have been put in. Yeah, that's up to that, right. But then there are additional sidewalks all the way up to Lexington. It, uh, it just yeah, so looks uh, a little different that those are just kind of out of place compared to the whole plan. But so I'm just trying to understand what What's the thinking there? Yeah, yeah. So just uh, uh, a quick summary on the sidewalk, at least the anticipated sidewalk is uh, Sunset Avenue uh, has sidewalk on the east side with this year's project, uh, and then we would continue that sidewalk only between Second and Third Street on uh, Sunset. Okay. Um, on uh, Third Street Northeast, there would be sidewalk on the reconstruction portion between uh, Sunrise and Sunset. And there would also be a block of sidewalk only um, on the south side of the park. And then uh, it's not, not actually shown in here. Again, this is kind of a kind of more of a discussion piece when I prepared it, but that would be to have sidewalk on the west side of the, the north side park as well. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, as far as other areas, I do have a question, you know, sidewalk on north side of uh um, Second Street between Lexington and Lindale, it's more uh, more likely it would happen, but um, just had some geographical 
uh, or topographical concerns that we have to address when that actually does happen. And looking at other areas on Lindale um, and uh, Lindale specifically, we haven't necessarily identified where that sidewalk would go yet. So on 2nd Street Northeast going east, does that continue all the way to sunset then? Exist now? Yes, yeah, so, so that's being done right um, now, Bruce. So just okay. to touch base a little bit on some of these random streets that don't have any rework happening, it's just a sidewalk. That's because those streets have been completed. Okay. Um, within you. the last 10 to 15 years, my hopes are we're not going to be back in that northeast side of town in the next 10 to 15 years. So this is the time to do it since we're in the area to get the sidewalks um, up to Northside Park slash uh, the streets that were done 10 years ago. Kind of not with other projects, kind of, hey, this section um, got really bad earlier than we expected. So we did a one block instead of phases like we are, like you see six blocks at a time being done. So it's just trying to complete that area. Okay. Then 10th, 10th Avenue, the, the idea of a roundabout seems like a brand new idea to me. I guess I'm not familiar with that discussion. Is it just a roundabout in itself, or is there any work being done in 10th Avenue Southeast? Yep, so that was actually a, a staff. I, um, we talked about uh, 10th Avenue Southeast there um, because it's kind of falling apart if you've driven down it. 10th um, Avenue Southeast? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's how you mean. Uh, it, it was scheduled for 26, correct, Matt? Um, originally. Yeah, we were looking at Millen Overlay uh, in 26 in certain sections, but um, it took a beating this year. We're, it, it, we're potentially moving it up just due to its condition. That being said, uh, I think it was Ken and I were talking one day about how terrible that particular intersection is uh, for anybody who's not on 10th Avenue um, in terms of kind of the blind spot and speeds people come through and if something could be looked at. Um, and so we just talking with Chris, he said, well, no, now would be the time to look at potentially doing something if you're tearing the road up already. So just including it just traffic-wise, would, would improvements make sense there um, while we're tearing the road up, kind of like when we realigned uh, over there by the hospital on Columbus while we were tearing it up was the time to do it. I'm not opposed to it. I, I don't, I haven't experienced what you're discussing there. On the times I go on there on a fairly regular basis, and so I don't notice it. I might not be going the heavy traffic time periods, but I, I get what you're saying. Um, so it'd be nice to have some, you know, supporting data to, because that would be done all by itself, right? It'd be done part of this. It would be part of the 10th, 10th Avenue overlay. Or oh, yeah, overlay. whenever we end up doing the mill and overlay, if if the data and we decide to move forward with any sort of improvements on that intersection, would be to do them at that point. Yeah, the mill, uh, the roundabout would be a, a more of a more intense construction. Correct. Than just mill and overlay. Correct, <laughs> but but 10th Avenue itself would just be a mill, be mill and overlay. overlay. Okay. So would you do any traffic counts on that cross street? So we actually had done that. That's really why this issue came up, is we had done traffic counts on 3rd and 10th Avenue. Uh, we had identified uh, both speeding mainly on 10th Avenue um, being a concern, which is partly why Tim set the uh, traffic trailer up there. And then further down on 10th, we have the permanently mounted um, mm -hmm. traffic speed sign there. But um, when we had actually done the application for the um, intersection, um, Rapid flashing beacon at 10th and 1st by Praha Village and IV. Um, we had submitted data um, actually looking at uh, crash data for 1st Avenue, and then 3rd was almost as high as 1st for um, severity of crashes and number of crashes um, that we had at 10th. And that was kind of the initial thought of well, we've got a little bit of an issue here with speed, a little bit with um, traffic um, incidents that we had going on there. And then um, as the roundabout um, over on 3rd and Alton opened up, more people are taking that route through as well. So it's really made the cross traffic, uh, like Josh noted, during, we'll just say, rush hour, as much as we get in New Prague, uh, it's difficult to get out onto the road. And pedestrians are, quite frankly, um, we've been hearing it from them for years as well, just trying to get over to Memorial Park or the ball field. Um, so I think we do have a lot of data on that. And a lot of that was actually in the grant application. When will we get the information on that, the estimate, the... That, that would be as part of this study. So any data or information on whether we should proceed with that would come out of this feasibility study. Yeah, if there's any reason to present something sooner, just, uh, you know, with, with our schedule being an October presentation and November proceeding into design, uh, most likely around that same time, it could be something that be presented to council sooner. 
uh, for for a decision before the the counts for before the uh, feasibility report is uh, fully complete. Well, I, I, it sounds like it's a great idea. It's not an accessible project, though. It's, it's general fund money, right? No, that's something we have to talk about. But I don't know how that's going to. Yeah, be I mean, I guess that'd be come out of the conversation we'd have with Chris. And, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it would probably be part of the same funding that would refund the mill and overlay. Yeah, and, and this is a municipal state aid route, so you'd be use, utilizing your state aid funding for this portion of the project as well. This isn't, um, when you say county, the county doesn't have any anything on There's that. There's no county involvement in this route. I'm, I'm sorry, municipal state aid, your MSA routes that you have identified okay. in town, so. Okay. So 10th Avenue um, is is a state aid route, and it would be able to, you would be able to use funds from that, and um, could do an advance on state aid funding uh, if needed to to uh, get the project done a little bit sooner. Okay, we're going to be the city of roundabouts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, <clears throat> as a guy that lives over there and uses that intersection ten times a day, it is. Yeah, it's gotten a lot yeah. worse. I'll, I'll say it, it's especially bad for the people on third. Like, yeah. like yeah. on tenth, you can almost go through without a problem. But if either you're trying to walk, which my family does quite a bit across the street, or yeah. if you're coming off of Third Street, you you can sit there for a long time. Yep. And when you do get out there, due to kind of that blind spot, suddenly someone's right behind you, so mm -hmm. you kind of have to gun it out of that corner as well. Mm -hmm. Does that have a rush hour to it then? Yeah, it does. As yep. a matter of fact, yeah. after school, I was yes. going to after yeah. work. You know, before school, before work. Before work. I, I like the idea of it slowing traffic down because I do think that's what I do notice there. Yeah, they clip through there pretty good. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So you need, uh, so the proposed engineering services for this project is not to exceed what? Fifty thousand? Not to exceed, uh, not, not to exceed seventy-three thousand dollars. I try, um, <laughs> and that is. <laughs> You're you can always quick, try. You're kind of quick there to catch that stuff. <laughs> uh, and that, that includes the topographic survey, which we use for a later design, and then also the report itself. Um, I will mention, I did not include in your packet a resolution, which would be to order the project or, or preparation of the people bill report, which I normally include in this uh, with this proposal, which I don't know why I did not this time. Uh, so I'll be bringing that to your, your, your July meeting, which I think is just the, the second one that you're having this uh, next month. Correct. As, so, a, as a formality, but uh, you, you do not need to have that presented at the same time as as this proposal approval. Uh, the the resolution is um, it's a four twenty nine requirement uh, yeah. that you'll have to submit at a later time. But uh, for the purpose of what we're doing right now, um, that could be presented at a later point. So you're okay with it, the second meeting in July for the resolution? To for the resolution, it? I would ask that. Uh, just to, to stay on schedule with everything else to to uh, review and approve the the engineering services, which allows us to get a lot of stuff moving along before that time. So this is different than the resolution. The review. Correct. Yeah, this okay. is just this is going to be just the proposal uh, for construction for engineering services, and then um, you'll officially be ordering us to prepare the feasibility report at the July seventeenth meeting. I think it is. Gotcha. Okay. Any questions? Otherwise, I'd take a motion to approve the engineering services for phase one with SCH. So moved. Second. There's been a motion by Sean, seconded by Rick. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Do you have anything else for us? That should be it. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank okay. you. All right, um, the next item on the agenda is the public is invited to be heard on matters not on the agenda. Um, is there anybody in the audience here? Come on up. What you got to do, Rob, is state your full name and then your address. All right. Rob Crow Kramer, 606 Columbus Avenue, South New Prague. Um, just want to take a couple of minutes. Um, I am in the process of purchasing the Pioneer Saloon. I tried getting the paperwork in to present it to the council. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't get everything in the time on uh, last Thursday when I was talking with Jess. Um, we do have everything pretty much with the states, everything all lined up with uh, tax ID number, federal tax ID number, and all that stuff. We're just waiting on insurance. Um, we're trying to get this done before Dozinki 
at all possible. Um, we actually kind of want to be in there beforehand so we get things set up. July 3rd is your meeting that you're typically going to have, but you understand you guys postpone or cancel that one. Um, I have two requests. Um, if for some reason you end up having a, a meeting, something changes, if I could get notified so I could come to that meeting. And then uh, one August 17th, uh, or yeah, July 17th, you guys have the other one, mm -hmm. I can come to that yes. one. And then uh, August 7th is your next one. I will be out of town. <laughs> And I think it's important that I'm here. Is there a way I can do that online at all? Or? Yeah, they can. You can contact them. They'll they'll pipe you in like okay. this. All right. Um, and Those then, are my, you know, my kind of my two requests that I'm asking for yeah. the, the mayor and the council. So what what's what's what would be the big holdup other than well, you're getting your insurance together, but it would be setting the public hearings, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, for liquor licenses. Yeah. Uh, yes, I've heard the transfer the background whatever. check. How long does that take you, Tim? Not long, or no, no. Oh. it wouldn't take long once it's submitted. Yeah, I mean, many times once we have stuff, we can get stuff rolling on, on the back side. Like, if you submit that stuff to staff as soon as possible, and we, oh. and we can do a lot of stuff before the final decision for the council is made. That way, because okay. there has so to be all that stuff, yep. going on the yeah, back that's side, why. So. Yep, yep. So, I have everything but the insurance, and he just said. I'm actually using Mark's same insurance agent from oh, the Pioneer, okay. so he knows the building, he knows everything. Yep. Our our proposed amount is a lot different than what Mark had, so because we're going to be open for seven days a week, where he's only open half that. So okay. um, that's the numbers that they're just trying to change a little bit and everything. So um, I guess as soon as I get my insurance this week, he said, and then I'll I'll get the information over to to yep. Jess over at the city or whatever. Yep. So. Yeah, get that into us as soon as possible, um, okay. and we can start working on our on the backside. So, who do I talk to about getting um, so I can go online? Uh, talk talk to Jess. Okay, talk All to right. Jess, and then she'll give you the link and and because if you look on top of these meetings, yep, or on top of these agendas, there's the link. Okay, perfect. And then she would get that for you. Perfect. So, All right. thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So we can put aside the rumors that you're buying corner bar. You can scratch that. That's good. <laughs> yeah. no. well, good recovery, though. I'm yeah. surprised you got Mark to go with. But. Yeah. Nice. It's, all right. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is um, resolutions. We have a resolution setting a public hearing on the cannabis sale moratorium. Uh, yes. As I mentioned last time, uh, the state is allowing us to uh, put a moratorium in place from August 1st of 2023 to January of 2025. That being said, we do have to advertise as that uh, advertise to the public that we will be having a public hearing to talk about putting the moratorium in place. And so I guess tonight, all I'm asking to make sure that uh, we can meet all those timelines is that we um, just set a public hearing for July 20th. Uh, not asking for necessarily any decisions to be mm -hmm. made, just that we have it open and we can advertise the public so that the public also has an opportunity to come in and speak at that time. And the moratorium will say what? That the sales are limited to... to so, yes, and so this, <laughs> this public hearing would be to talk about putting a moratorium in place to limit the retail... to basically not allow retail sales until January of 2025. Um, it doesn't sound like retail sales will be allowed anyway, um, so there's a little confusion as to why we need to put a moratorium into place, but it's one of those stop gaps the state has allowed. And so I think most cities are trying to take advantage of it just because there's so much uncertainty going on. Um, but yes, hopefully by July 20th, we'll have more information when a decision actually has to be made. Um, we'll continue to try to scour that. But at this point, it would be uh, putting a moratorium in place on all cannabis sales within city limits until... Either we lift it or January 2025, whichever comes first. So we will have the resolution ordering. Then is that resolution stay or do does it go to an ordinance? It's an interim ordinance. It's so an interim ordinance. It would be, yeah, be basically a temporary ordinance. So okay. th th this resolution is just calling for the public hearing. Okay. We would then, if we decide to put into place a uh, interim ordinance, that will be voted on on the 20th of July. And the interim ordinance would say basically? Basically no sales okay. until the state allows it. Okay. 
With that being, as uh, everybody go, go ahead. Uh, with the resolution, I'll um, move to approve resolution 23-06-20-02 for the moratorium for cannabis sales. For the public uh, it's hearing. For the public hearing. Yep. Okay. Hey, is there a second on that? Second. And Bruce made the second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. All right. Um, uh, let's see. Summary of future tax levy estimations and contract proposal. Uh, yes. So a couple of meetings ago, the city council asked for kind of looking out a little bit better at what tax levies might look like. Um, when we were talking police facility. And so I did, imp uh, Robin and I worked together to put together the, I guess, four very general scenarios that we looked at. Um, as my memo mentions, uh, these are certainly not uh, even proposals on how I believe we should spend. I was trying to keep things as on the board as possible, um, looking at what will eventually be discussed over the upcoming budget as some of the assumptions that we may be making in our long-term financial plan. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, the four scenarios that are included uh, would be if we um, levy each year for any of our uh, CIP equipment needs, if we bond uh, each year for those same equipment needs, and then whether or not the police station is included in those. Um, so some of the assumptions just for your guys' uh, knowledge right now, uh, we assumed a 6.5% increase in personnel spending each year. Um, this doesn't just mean salary, but it also includes all your benefits, such as insurance, um, FICA, Social Security, as all that stuff goes up. Uh, for 24, since it is coming up, we were able to be a little more accurate, and I think we're projecting a total increase of personnel spending at about 5.8%. Uh, in terms of equipment for these assumptions, I just to keep it kind of simple and not knowing how equipment will last, we assumed that everything on the CIP would be purchased as is currently sitting there. Uh, that is not necessarily always be the case. Matt is very good about assessing our equipment's needs. But for something four years out, it may look great now. But who knows, in three years, it may suddenly go downhill real fast. And so for the sake of... Um, the numbers in front of you, it's just assuming that CIP will be go forward as is. Uh, we also assume that the EDA will continue to levy at $75,000. Obviously, as we get into future planning, that number may go up or down depending on how um, we see contributions. But for our numbers in front of us, that's what we're looking at. Um, and then the other assumption just being that some spending is naturally going to increase as the cost of goods and services rise. So um, many things like supplies or service, services from an attorney or engineering we are assuming are increasing somewhere between three to five percent per year. Obviously, as we get closer, we can um, change those projections year to year. So, all that being said, um, kind of looking at this stuff, uh, the tax capacity. I realized uh, this morning. Actually, I realized it on Monday morning. Um, we did not, had not gotten updated for you, so I can definitely send you over those updated numbers because I know. Um, Bruce had asked about what, or not tax capacity, tax rate, um, what, the, what that tax rate could potentially look like as things fluctuate. Um, but I think generally when you look at the sheets uh, that I provided in your packet, uh, it seems when you're look, obviously the police station, um, we wouldn't be seeing any of those costs come out until 2025, which is why on each of those scenarios you see uh, 2025 spike. It just also happens to hit up with on the CIP. We have a uh, fire truck that is due to be purchased in 2025. Um, haven't talked to Chief Rinda at all about the condition of that or whether they're ready to move forward with that in 2025. But um, that is, again, as I said, we assume that everything is just being purchased as is on the CIP for now. Um, so that it spikes in 25 regardless. The spike is just extra high in 25 on the uh, portions that include. Um, the police station. So uh, I guess are there questions right now about the scenarios or the numbers in front of you? Uh, just to piggyback, I think on your comment, I guess when I looked at the schedule, it, um, I think kind of what you said, the it seems like this, the schedule is using the tax capacity number as a variable. 
please, as you're showing, the tax rate is being consistent across the board, so. Uh, yes, so yeah, that number just kind of floated across. So um, as we started putting it together in our long-term financial plan, we can obviously talk about how um, that is. In terms of uh, tax capacity, I kind of assumed a kind of a 3% growth, whether that's, and it, the number may likely be higher. And like I said, that's something we can certainly talk about of how that tax capacity changes. Um, but I can send you over what would end up being the tax rate um, year in and year out. I know um, personally, while, we, while it's a number to look at, I always caution looking at the tax rate um, just because it is kind of an arbitrary number based on the values given to us by the county. Um, but I mean, that be, I, I, I'm much more interested, I guess, in that uh, whether it's a tax per capita um, on persons or a tax rate change from the previous year um, to me, it means a little bit more, but I can certainly send you the updated sheets that have the updated uh, tax rate estimates. I agree those are important. I would look at those uh, <clears throat> metrics also, but I think that the actual tax rate is something that's probably my number one metric that okay. I would look at, kind of at it, because I want to see how it affects an actual median-priced house or something like that. But based on these numbers, it, it's showing uh, my estimate is your tax capacity would project to be... A, um, you know, a 10 or 11% growth rate, which I'm not sure if that's high, too high or not. Yeah, so, so I guess I, if, I, if you have a pen, I can share those with you right now if you want to fill them in. You mean uh, the future ones? Uh, future ones for the city tax rates. So, so at I'm the coming up with a tax capacity about 17, what is that, 17 million or a billion uh, through 2028. I didn't figure out the tax rate, but... I guess my point I'm trying to make is that um, I, th I think we should try to estimate what we think our tax capacity is going to be in the next so many years, or at least five years out, or something like that, and then see what the tax rates come up with. And, and yes, and, and I so think that, it's and logical to assume that we hopefully will get some growth, or at least look at the last. Yeah, I think in the last four or five years, our growth rate in tax capacity was 14 percent, or something like that. Correct, and, and that was where, like I said, I think. We'll have the conversation when we're talking budget and long-term financial plan as to what we want to set that number at. Um, I'm real hesitant to set it too high, obviously, because that, I mean, I think a lot of our growth lately has been the residential value growth. And over the next couple of years, I think we're going to see that really drop off um, because they tend to be about 18 months behind. Yeah, I, I tend to agree, but I also think that we haven't got full valuation for the high V store, the other commercial development. Hopefully, that'll make up for some of the lack of residential, but I totally agree with that residential concept. We might even see values of houses come down. It hasn't really happened, I don't think. But and, and that's where, yeah, I think for the long-term funding, for the numbers that I, the tax rate numbers that I ended up doing this morning when I got here to work, um, I was assuming about a 3% increase in tax capacity year over year. Um, I, I think you could probably estimate even a little higher than that based on our history here. Uh, but that's just my opinion. But I think the fact that we try to estimate that and try to come up with what we think is yep. a decent number because it's, it's fair to say that hopefully the values will go up. Yeah. And, and that will reduce the uh, burden on the taxpayers. Yep. And yeah. And I'd, like I said, if, you, if we base it on a 3% increase year over year, I do have those numbers in front of me. I just hadn't gotten, I realized like I said, Monday morning that I had not sent those to you in the packet. So, um. And then just to make sure I understand, uh, I was just, we had, in the previous graphs, we had debt service drop off so significantly in 2028. I understand you're using estimates for future CIP road and construction, and you've got Correct. that in here. Is that is that why that it's not even close to what the projecting here is? Yeah, so th those projection notes, when we look back into them actually for this year's budget cycle, last last fall when we were doing them, um, we discovered the numbers they were using assumed a $1 million project um, every year outside of the year you were in. And so back okay. in 2019, they assumed 2020, 21, 22, 23 were million dollar projects. Um, as you guys know, those years were much higher projects. They just never... I'm not sure why they chose million dollar projects to build that graph out, but that's how they did it. So when when Robin and I started looking at, well, what does actual projects look like, whether it's the next couple years or working with Matt as to what street overlay costs actually are, 
that's why the graph doesn't look like it has historically has. So then if we extend these columns all past 2028, we wouldn't see a drop off at all, really? I, I do believe there's going to be a drop off. It's just not going to be nearly as significant as quick as as it has shown in the past, because I do believe projects are going to get cheaper as we just do mill and overlays. Um, they're just going to be valued at more than the million dollars that was originally projected. I think right now, working with Matt and Chris Knutson, they're, even something as mill and overlaying like 10th Avenue would be like a million and a half to a $2 million project, not the one that would have been projected five, ten years ago. I guess I'd be interested in knowing if past 2028, if you see a material decrease, um, a trend there, if it's saving us two or three hundred thousand a year, I mean that's half the, almost half the cost of the new payment, mm -hmm. yeah, the police building. Mm -hmm. So even though we might have a burden for the first few years, if we know that that's long term, the decision is, is more reasonable. I mean. Because yeah, we, once we, you do once you do tell us those tax rates, it's going to create some eyeballs. Yep. Yeah. We we can certainly try to project out. Uh, like like we said, it gets harder because projects like Tenth Avenue come two years sooner than expected and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But um, we can certainly take a crack at seeing what there is. Um, it just becomes more and more guesswork the farther out we get. Right, and I totally agree. But if you at least can explain to taxpayers or residents, these are the assumptions they can. Agree or disagree with them, but at least you yep. can have that conversation as far as mm -hmm. what logic did you use to make the decision. But I think some kind of increase in tax capacity is a legitimate assumption to make. And uh, and then if our debt service is going to fall off after 2028, we have a 30 year or 25 year bond or whatever it is. You know, it's a it's a long term decision, not just the first yep. few years. And whenever this gets built, you can make the first few years payments lower if you want to, to offset that if we know it's going to, you know, if it makes sense. Um. Okay. Okay. I guess were there other questions about the numbers at this point? Other other data you may want to see? Well, I think that data is important, um, but. Even using the, the the presentation we got from old uh, seventy thousand square foot building that the community wants as well, that's going to be mm. even not at the four twenty five. I used I think three fifty. It's twenty three million dollars, and then when when does that trunk line have to be done? So um, so so I know that I mean that's that trunk thirteen line, million dollars. Yeah, that trunk line. We are currently SEH hopefully is finishing up the RFP for us soon, so we can get that out. I know speaking. Um, with Ken and Matt, um, Ken recalled uh, when that had been discussed in the past, things like a sewer trunk line, there were um, thoughts up in the air of how it could be funded through development, not necessarily even on the back of current taxpayers. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love so, that. Yeah. So, 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 so things like that, that yes, it, it might be a $20 million trunk line, but maybe it is the new houses and new businesses that pay for it, not the existing houses and businesses. Mm -hmm. So um, that'll hopefully be all conversations that come out of the um, feasibility studies for those. Okay. I just didn't want to make too many assumptions oh. in mm -hmm. starting in 2028 20, no, yeah. when all these things and, are and, coming to and, and, and Chris kind of mentioned it, and I, I think Rick brought it up as well. Um, we have already started talking to um, our four, now four representatives, who knows who will be who and how many we'll have by the time we need them, um, about we do have these major projects coming up. Mm -hmm. and. Start putting them on your radar because we're going to start talking to you about it more. I don't know if New Prague has ever utilized state bonding, but they're about to get an earful to because I know I've talked to administrators um, who have been like, I was in this tiny little sleepy community and there wasn't a lot going on, so I said, why not? They just started pushing, and because no one else is pushing, they started getting on. And so um, Dwayne and I are going to exp start exploring that avenue real heavy with our elected officials to see. Um, if we can go that route to help us with funding. With something anyway. <laughs> we'll see. We will see. Yes. Okay. Um, and then there's a contract proposal behind that. On that. Oh, yes. You all, uh, you'd ask for um, what wold design uh, costs and contract might look like. Um, so... 
uh, John McNamara had sent over that proposal. Um, if we were to pr pr proceed with the police station, um, that was, this would be kind of the contract cost. Very similar to what SEH gives us. Um, SEH usually has broken it down into phases. This would kind of be the total, um, kind of the total cost to us if we were to go forward. Uh, generally assuming uh, basically is they take 7% of total construction costs and would design and then manage the project all the way to the end for us. So to build a police facility, 731000 to do the yeah, drawings. So, so, and yeah, so, so it would be about 10.4 for the, that they're estimating for the construction and the building of the facility, and then 731 for their fee on top of that. Mm -hmm. And they act as a project manager too, right? Correct. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on that? Yeah, Otherwise, thank you. Thank you for getting that because I did ask you to get that. Um, next is a school resource officer agreement. So this is the one that we told you to Correct. act with a little rework. Yep. So this one includes the rework. Um, I worked with Kennedy and Graven. Um, Uh, yeah, so they, they put in the uh, termination language as well as the uh, cure language. A lot of this is new to me, Maggie, so mm -hmm. if, I, if I mess up my words, you yep, can good. scold me. <laughs> um, I know that you guys had discussed, but there was never really any decision ultimately on renewal terms or that sort of thing. Um, so I, I left that as is. Um, but otherwise, the red line copy of what, they, uh, of what you guys asked for was included in here. Maggie, what's your opinion on it? Well, what I read is is pretty basic, but I think it's important to include in the contract um, some language about uh, breach of contract and the cure period. Um, and then if we're not able to satisfy the cure, then we do have an opportunity to terminate the contract. Uh, and that's just so that both parties can come to the table and... Uh, you know, try to work it out instead of just automatically terminating the contract. Um, and then the same for dispute resolution is going to um, mediation, which I think is always a, a good thing to start mm -hmm. with before ending up in court. Yep. So I, I guess if there are other questions, um, I know that school board meets next week, I believe it is, and uh, they're... Um, I was told their deadline for getting this back on their agenda is Thursday. It's on their very similar schedules to setting up their agendas as we okay. have. So then you're looking at uh, reviewing the proposed and approving this or just Correct. getting it? Correct. I was looking at an approval from our side to send back over to them. Okay. And still keeping it at a, at a five-year term. Correct, unless yep. for some reason yep. the council would like to see something else. I know we talked about you, the, the shorter you get, you kind of lose some of the stability of it. Exactly. Okay, any other questions? I'll make a motion to approve this uh, school resource officer agreement with Independent School District 721. I'll second. Been a motion and seconded. Is there any other discussion or questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Vision doc, doc, visioning document update. Uh, yes, so I just included in your packet a digital copy mm -hmm. that had updates on a lot of the items. Um, like I said, being that this is just an update, uh, I didn't provide a fit paper copy, but if any of you would like a paper copy of the update, I can certainly provide it. Uh, going forward, I will. Uh, provide this on just a quarterly basis just so you all can kind of keep track of where we're at with various items. Um, as you read through, you'll notice some of them I'm saying we might try to push it back to 24, uh, or uh, there was one in here uh, about uh, the microphone one for here in the council chambers that recommending we not proceed with just due to the cost of a single microphone being like $6,000. So that's crazy. Um, we'll just have Matt talk louder from the back instead mm -hmm. of giving him a mic. <laughs> okay. But I guess if there's anything specifically you'd like me to speak to, I certainly can. Um, I have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, <clears throat> in reference to um, golf uh, bylaws yeah, by for the golf course, 
Um, I know a year or two it came up with uh, some issues about looking at how that was created and just to review the legalities of the charter. I, I think the question came up with the approval of payments, if we were supposed to approve them or not. It was kind of a gray area, I think, at the time. But um, I'm not sure the bylaws that are be, being drafted or have been drafted, what they all include. But I'd be interested in seeing that. And okay. I can dig up the questions that came up and see if we need to dig deeper since you're looking yeah. at it anyway. Already. Yep, we certainly can. Yeah, because I know I had some of those questions when I first came. This is the first golf board I'd ever worked with, and I kind of wanted to see what their powers were, what they were yeah. doing, and, but, we, and we're very vague. Um, yeah, there's three different three different ordinances, I think, that either created and reaching or changed them. Or, or mentioned it, yeah. And yes. there's still kind of a gray area way back when, when I was working on that dealing with your authority to approve payments and things like that. So I, if there's not opportunity to clean up some of that stuff, it would be nice. Yes, and that's what this process was, so hopefully we're all kind of on paid. And they've even had questions for me about what they are allowed to do and what they should pass on. And yeah, hopefully we get to the end of this process and everyone will have their answers. The uh, discussion about a city developer's guide I thought was interesting. I'm not sure what's all involved, what's in there. I think it's nice that we have one. Um, I'm not sure what it is. If it's something we should just let the EDA know about, if they'd be interested in knowing what, what that is. It's actually a document we've had on our website, and um, essentially when we meet with a developer, if they're going to do a, a residential or commercial development, it's a guidebook that has everything from provisions of the ordinance for subdivision to zoning regulations, and then just gives oh. a step-by-step -step of you know timing and process from beginning to end to get a development on the ground. Okay. It's really used by staff and then the development. Nothing that you guys ever see because it just contains, we'll just say cheat sheets as it were, to get through that process. It's really all it does. But we did update that. And but it is on the website? It is on the website, yep. Well, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad to see that we're using the document and the, this as a tool. And I think for, for me anyway, it's nice to see progress for things that are being worked on and and that you're keeping it up to date and kind of mm -hmm. keeping it out there. So I appreciate everyone's effort in trying to keep it updated. Okay. The next item well, is miscellaneous and adjournment, so um, go around the room. Matt? Tim? <laughs> <laughs> um, notice real quickly our three quarter uh, records clerk will start next week and then our sergeant our new sergeant is doing very well so very appreciative of that and things are going very well good Robin I don't have anything Ken nothing Josh uh, just one item just for your I guess brief discussion. Uh, so this morning uh, when I came into work, I did have an email that uh, the property on 412 Fifth Avenue did counter. Um, I didn't have time to put together a closed meeting because we do require three days to uh, put together out an agenda like that. So I guess my question to you all, um, I guess there's three options we have before us. One, uh, we wait until our July was it 17, 20, whatever that July meeting is to talk about it. Um, we hold a special meeting to talk about it in closed session um, or we talk about it in open session. I guess that would be um, generally I'm one, stuff like that. I, As much as I like transparency, you talk about some of that stuff behind closed doors and then bring your decision out. There's a reason why the state of Minnesota allows us to do that. Um, but if for some reason you want to talk about it out in the open, we can certainly do that. I would say no. I would too. I like it closed. Yep. Well, uh, just arrange a, a special meeting. You got three days, right? Well, so that's my question. Do we want to wait until the middle of July when no. we're already going to convene, or come back sooner? I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't either. Why? Because let's hear it. I, I want to hear it. Oh. Well, I guess you know it's a counter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of tells you something. Well, I'd be interested to see what it is. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. I, I wouldn't sit on it for too long, though. I mean, that's... Because that's almost a month away. Yeah. To our next meeting, so... 
I agree. It's, that, that wouldn't be responsive to wait that long. Um, and I guess if you guys wanted a special meeting, I guess how soon would you want it? I'm assuming after the 4th, before the 4th. Are we at the 20th? I mean, can, can 20th, we still yeah. have it? We could have it in three days from now. Correct. And it's only going to take so long. What do people's calendars look like for next week? Is that something you want to do after, before? I guess I don't know work schedules. If Let's just do it Monday and get it over with. There you go. I like it. On the 26th. Say commission meeting in the afternoon, but otherwise Monday night's free unless someone really wants to attend the school board meeting. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, but Tuesday night I have golf board, and then Wednesday I got planning. So is that next week or not? Yeah, it is. The 26th. The, the, I guess does Monday night work? No. So Monday would be. Good for me. Do we want to go 5, 5.30, 6? God, the way traffic's been for me. Let's make it. That's why I was late tonight. Five thirty. Well, let me get six in. Yeah, if we could do six. Six o'clock. Okay. I'm good. Okay, I will uh, have just put out that notice. We'll say six o'clock, uh, Monday the twenty sixth. Closed session with open at the back end in case there's a decision we have to make. Patrick, I don't know how long you want to hang out for. <laughs> okay. You can oh, be, that could be interesting. You can watch on TV that, then, the that. open session. <laughs> That's all I've got. Okay, Mankey. I don't have anything. Sean. Um, I had a question uh, from a rental owner. Where are we on the rental ordinance? Is that, is that gonna come up soon? I just got uh, some updated language from um, Dave Anderson from um, Sky Riggs' office on the rental um, ordinance that we're prepping it to bring it back to the council for how you would like to continue discussions on that. The task force is done. They passed a recommendation to forward it to you um, with these uh, this language that they needed to have the attorney modify. So okay. we'll probably have that in front of you at July 17th. Okay. And then, and then will some of the rental, oh, the task force is done, but will some of the rental um, people in town be notified because they might want That's to... what we'll talk about. How, how would you like to proceed? Um, oh, so we won't be making any decision no, or anything on this. Okay. No, Dave Anderson believes that a recent Supreme Court case um, that – Anything even remotely related to land use, which he believes rental ordinance does, would need to have a uh, planning commission public hearing before any final um, decision can be made by the council anyway. So we'll go over all the all that on the ins 17th. and outs of that probably in the okay. 17th and how you want to approach moving forward or not. Okay. So, so are you presenting a draft ordinance or what? It will be a draft ordinance and then basically council, how would you like to proceed? And legally, what do we need to do to proceed if you would like to uh, put that in place? Great, because you're going to update us on the Supreme Court rooms. Yep. Okay. And then the other thing is, is does anybody want to do the newsletter this month? I do not have time to do it, but I'll uh, throw it out. Uh, I believe that already went out. I did it. Oh, did it? Good. I thought it was the 22nd that it was due, so... Uh, I think it was last week because all of a sudden I started getting emails. And oh, so, was it? Okay. I thought it was I, a 20 I was, I was told there was a lot of other stuff, but she still needed a small paragraph or two. Okay. Did you get a, a list together of the months, months that we're supposed to be doing them to? Uh, I will, I'm there, not even sure what the how it's being handled right now. One was that it, it used to just roll. Well that, well, that was Barb. Oh, yeah. so, okay. And so when, when it left Barb, it moved to uh, Laura. Um, Laura, who's kind of taking on, and I'm not sure if she's taking on temporarily or whatnot. It'll but, go back to Jeff. Um, hopefully we'll get back into kind of a mode, and I'll have her send out, these are the months that you're looking at doing. Okay. Data boy. Thank you for doing that for me, Josh. You get it, data boy. I, I, I think <laughs> they're worthless, but you can have one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> When it gets that high, they got to mow its weeds. <laughs> so that was all I had. Okay, I don't have anything. Nothing. Nothing. Okay, I take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion and second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. I was reading through the minutes, Maggie, and I thought she she had actually got the second on that one too. <laughs> <laughs>